Well, welcome to module three of condition and prognosis reports. Here we're going to be looking at some of the problems that can, can arise. Um, it seems the actual report itself is quite straightforward. What sort of problems are we talking about here? Yeah, you're right. The condition and prognosis report is very straightforward because it's really just looking at medical matters. Sure. The problem tends to come with the nature of the report. And by that, I mean that to in order to prepare a report, the expert, and it's normally a doctor, will have to meet with the claimant. And the expert has to bear in mind the whole time that at no stage does the claimant become their patient. Now this is a difference, isn't it? They obviously see patients, whether they're doctors, dentists or whoever. Uh, there's the normal patient healthcare practitioner relationship. Well, how would you describe the relationship between a, an expert and a claimant? Oh, that's tricky. It's an expert is there really to assist the court. They're not there to help or treat the claimant. So the relationship between the expert and claimant is one of a distance. And it's, it's easy to emphasize with a claimant. I've met claimants, they're lovely people, but the expert has to remember that they are really acting for the court, a third party. So in effect, they're a quasi-agent for the judge. The yeah. judge doesn't have that technical knowledge, if the, and so it's like the judge is asking the questions in effect in order to come to the decision. So they have to remain impartial. Now, why is this a problem? Is it because they empathise or what's, what, where's the problem there? It is a problem because it's very easy for a clinician, someone who comes into daily contact with patients, to see the claimant as a patient, to strike up a friendship, a rela um, relationship, by that I mean a patient-doctor relationship, because that is the way that they're used to treating people who come to see them. So this is different, isn't it? It's very different, and that is why I think it's crucial to keep any communication at a distance. So what's your personal recommendations here about how to achieve that? Personally, and it is very much my personal recommendations, I would say just keep all communication at arm's length. The instructing solicitor is there, use them to communicate with the claimant. Now other than making the initial consultation appointment, there's not really that much scope for communication between the claimant or expert, or at least there shouldn't be. Um, try and avoid email correspondence. I mean, we've all done it. Email correspondence is very informal. It's, it has a tendency to be chatty. And that could be misconstrued if it were to be seen by the opposing party or the court. If you really can't avoid having direct contact with the claimant by email, then just make sure that you would be happy for someone else to see that email. Now you mentioned that in module one about um, email correspondence because there is a tendency to make it informal. Um, so it's the test, and I think this perhaps is my view, <laughs> that everything, every communication potentially could be seen by the court and it can be slightly embarrassing if, if it's a bit too pally pally. I think definitely, I think that is the best way to view everything. Once you've prepared something, once you've sent an email, ask yourself, would I be happy for the court or the other side to see that? We mentioned uh, in module two, I think, about um, you know further treatment. Any other comments at this point where there could be potential problems? Yeah, I've just laboured the point that the uh, relationship between an expert and claimant isn't one of doctor-patient or a clinician patient, I'm now going to perversely go back on that and say, but despite that, if there is an obvious um, course of treatment that would benefit the claimant, then you must point it out. And who do you point that out to? I would stick it in the report. So that Not, don't mention it to the claimant. Um, you could mention it to the claimant, but the only trouble is sometimes if you speak directly to the claimant about something, they can become fixated with it or they can start to do research and, and get um, too, too involved in that kind of thing. I would mention it to the instructing solicitor and um, that will go in the report and then just take it from there really. So preferably not to the claimant because of course the report is about current condition or previous history and the prognosis. So is it best that they don't mention it to the claimant? The claimant's going to find out because they're going I to see the report. So. But you could mention it in passing maybe. Often what happens is an expert will um, examine the patient, examine the notes, look at the background and then realise well actually perhaps another sort of expert's required. What's your 
thoughts on that? Oh, if an expert thinks another special teacher required, then please, please say so. Even if your instructing solicitor has been doing this type of work for 40 years, they're not going to have the knowledge that the expert has. And anything that you think would help to um, properly value the claim, then please let everyone know. And of course, there is a danger of going outside the expert's area of expertise delineated by their qualifications and experience. And so if they feel that and other experts are required, it's actually vital that they don't go out that, go outside their field, isn't it? Yeah, they mustn't go outside their field. They and really so they were put in the report to the solicitor, we think we need a neurologist or whatever it is, because that's outside my field. Definitely, yeah. Um, there's a lot of work to prepare for the actual examination and then they, obviously the examination and the consideration of the prognosis. Can this cause a problem? It can if the expert's very busy. That's why I'd recommend that if you're going to take on this type of work, just make sure your diary has the space to make the commitment, make sure you're going to have time to meet with the um, claimant, make sure you're going to have time to prepare the report, and make sure you've done as much pre-reading as possible before you actually examine the claimant. Now, our experts will have heard of the case of Jones and Caney, that they can be liable on contract and negligence. How does that impact these type of reports? Well, I'd like to reassure experts, I don't think it's going to have a massive impact on condition and prognosis reports, and I really don't think it would be good to tailor the um, expert reports in the light of that case. But the type of things I would foresee with relation to condition and prognosis are going to relate to if the claimant feels that their injury has been underestimated or if they think that actually their prognosis isn't as good as the doctor said and that they're going to need more care than they've been compensated for. It's those kind of areas, undervaluations, underestimations. So in terms of any advice on how not to be sued, it's thorough preparation, clear methodology about how you came to your opinion. Any other thoughts about not being sued. Yeah, obviously you can't 100% guard against not being sued, but just make sure the report's well researched, well reasoned, and that you can back up everything you've said in there. Um, and I just would like to reassure people, um, in 2002, the um, barristers were allowed to be sued and there hasn't been a floodgate of litigation against them. So hopefully it won't be the same for experts. And also, of course, uh, if you are quoting research papers, make sure they're current they haven't been superseded yeah please keep up to date with all the relevant literature that's vital and of course tying into what we said in module two about compliance with time limits yeah please please comply with time limits the penalties to the people paying you could be enormous and that could get you into trouble professionally and potential to being sued and of course um, making sure you've got proper instructions definitely yes if it's not clear then just ask for clarification Okay, well, so there are problems, but they can be sorted. Yeah, they can definitely be sorted. All right, thank you so much, Sarah. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, well, that's the end of this module. We'll come back to you soon. Thank you.